Hello, everyone. Uh, as Jim mentioned, I will be the moderator uh, for the Medical Cannabis Investment Pitch Competition. Uh, I'm excited to be here today on this webinar where we have nine experienced investors, uh, many of whom I've uh, been on panels with over the years and worked with on various portfolio companies in uh, overlapping capacities. Um, so great, great list of investors who are judges and joined by additional investors and sources of capital watching from around the world. Uh, we have eight companies that were selected from over 40 companies that applied and we believe we have a great cross section of companies that we'll be presenting today. So first I will uh, just be going over the, uh, the format and then I will get into uh, you know, to the judges themselves and then, and then why we're all here are the presenting companies. Um, so first thing, uh, I will be giving uh, an introduction to each judge who will have about a minute to introduce themselves. Please be mindful of that minute. I will be uh, monitoring that closely. Uh, then I will be introducing each uh, presenting company and presenter. Uh, just keep in mind each company will have a total of 10 minutes, five minutes for presentation and four minutes for Q&A. So judges, please be mindful of that. So maybe initially just try to keep it to one question. Um, and so we can be uh, respectful of time. Um, after all eight presentations are done, uh, the judges in the audience will both be voting uh, for the presentation that they choose to be ranked number one. Uh, while the audience is voting, you'll actually get a little pop-up on your screen so you'll be able to vote. I'll be then asking each, each judge for their opinion as well. Uh, after we're done with that process, uh, we will announce the winning presenter, um, both selected by the judges and the winning uh, presenter selected by the audience. Okay, so that's the scoop for today. I will uh, come up to the uh, each judge uh, by alphabetical order. This is by no means ranked by anything other than alphabetical. <laughs> Uh, first, we have uh, Daniel Sachs, who's the founder and president of Sensi Properties. I think I'm unmuted now, sorry. Okay. Um, uh, how are you doing? Uh, so, founded Sensi Properties, the first uh, cannabis real estate investment company in Canada. Um, focused in that part of the space uh, in, in sale leasebacks and debt finance uh, within the cannabis space as well. Angel investor and invested in a number of different companies, advised a couple companies, uh, stuff like that. Very excited to be here. Thank you very much uh, for having me and thank you everyone for tuning in. Great. Well, you are very mindful of time. Thank you. <laughs> uh, next. We have uh, Dr. David uh, Kunick, who is the CEO of UCS Advisors. How are you doing, everyone? Dr. David Kunick, CEO and co-founder of UCS Advisors and Investor Relations. We are an investor relations advisory company um, where we work with high net worth individuals, both domestically and internationally, finding them deal flow in the cannabis and hemp sector. I'm proud to say that myself, I've been involved in the cannabis sector for 11 years now. I've actually started seven different cannabis companies in five different states and have actually raised over $20 million just for my own companies. And we really look forward to hearing the pitch competition for today. See if any of our investors are interested in any of the companies today. Thank you for having me today, Morgan and Brad. Great. Thank you. Next up, we have Evan Henneman, uh, Managing Director of Sands Lane Capital. Thanks, Morgan. Hey, uh, Sands Lane Capital, this is Evan Edeman. We're a purpose-driven venture firm focused on early stage consumer brands within cannabis and hemp. I've uh, been investing and advising in the cannabis space now for the past six years across a different, uh, few different platforms. Excited to be here and looking forward to the, uh, the companies. Thanks, Morgan. Great, good to see you, Evan. Uh, see you. Up next, we have Frank Sid, founder of CrowdChain. Hi, my name is Frank Sid, and uh, I'm the founder of CrowdChain. CrowdChain is a uh, crowdfunding portal. Uh, we focus on uh, primarily startups, uh, companies looking for revenue. We also have a broker dealer as well. Uh, we've been able to participate in the last few years in uh, a handful of, of companies in the cannabis space. 
uh, particularly in the medical cannabis space that have gone on to go public. So very happy to be here and excited to see what's out. Uh, next, we have John Manick, of, uh, who's a partner at Green Coast Capital. John, you'll have to unmute. There you go. We can see you talking, John. We can't hear you, though. Still can't hear you. <laughs> yep. Almost. Yeah, geez, I've been having some issues with my equipment. Uh, apologize for that. Um, just wanted to say it was really great hearing from Cheech. Uh, my background, technology, three different public exits. I've been in the cannabis for the last five years. I've invested in various different sectors. Um, Green Coast Capital is an amalgam of four family offices. One of the offices uh, was formed by a very extremely successful cannabis investor and then a couple others. We've all invested in the sector. so. We're looking at primarily early stage at this time right now. We also do pipes into uh, pr public companies as well. Great, thank you. Uh, up next, uh, Josh Kincaid, Capital Market Analyst at The Talking Hedge. Thank you. Yeah, Talking Hedge is a podcast to kind of focus on uh, the business side. Everything is looked at the lens of finance, so The Talking Hedge is a podcast. But the advisory firm that I run is called Super Chronics. And it's pivoted over the years. So right now, post-COVID, we're trying to focus on as many non-cannabis companies up in Canada. We're working with an airline, transporting plants and product coast to coast, with a World Trade Center's export store. And so excited to see what uh, companies are pitching and what's out there. Great. Thank you, Josh. Uh, up next, we have Joy Sonali, partner and chief operating officer at Big Rock. Hey, everybody. Uh, good to be here. Uh, so yes, uh, Morgan and I are actually usually right down the street from each other in Hayes Valley in San Francisco. I'm chatting with you guys today from a, a farm project that we operate up in Sonoma. Uh, we are investors in the space since 2016, uh, both via uh, syndications and a number of family offices. Um, we've invested in about 28 deals, mostly focused on California, plant touching uh, brands and surrounding technology and intellectual property. Um, and uh, we really love cultivation. <laughs> so I'm loving the background. Uh, we're all got our like flower crowns on. Uh, but yeah, I'm excited to, to be here and, and uh, participate and, and get to know some new companies. Thanks for having me. Great. I look forward to when we can uh, be neighbors again. In, in <laughs> I know, me too. Uh, up next, we have Sherry, Sherry Orlowitz, uh, founding partner of Artemis Holdings Group. I hope I'm unmuted. You are. Yeah. You're good to go. Okay. Well, it's great to be here and great to see new friends and old friends. Um, Artemis Holdings Group is a private investment and strategic advisory um, firm that I founded after acquiring about a dozen businesses, raising $100 million in the manufacturing and services industry. I got into cannabis in 2016 and made my first investment into MJ Freeway before it became a Kerna and uh, realized that capital was a problem. So I've undertaken some tough capital raises, including for Kerna and Jessica Billingsley. Um, our portfolio consists today of a half a dozen uh, companies, uh, including New Frontier, Thrive, Witty. Um, the kind of investments we like to make is first and foremost management teams and what I call early growth. I'm also the founder and chairman of the board of the Council for Federal Cannabis Regulation. The goal is to bring CPG companies into the industry and utilize their resources to work around an issue right now, which is mainstreaming uh, hemp constituents. And we believe that will help the legalization and make the market uh, a much more trusted market when names such as Kellogg's and Coca-Cola are making CBD products like cranberry, uh, Ocean Spray is doing today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sherry. Okay, and then up next, we have Skip Sanzeri, uh, Managing Director of Multiverse Capital. Hey, everybody. Thanks, Morgan and Brad, as well, for putting this on. Um, wonderful turnout. And, and just love these sorts of things. So um, my background, I entered the space in 2013, uh, actually, and ended up taking a company public in the space back then, which was 
kind of early and odd, but uh, but it was a success at the public level. Um, you know, moved forward and uh, kept in the space uh, in a variety of areas, and then recently launched Multiverse Capital, uh, which is uh, a new firm, and where we have uh, put together three funds. Um, one is a medicinal fund, one's recreational, one's ancillary. We did that strategy because we had heard that investors sometimes want to mitigate their risk. And, uh, you know, we've, we've talked to investors that may not want to invest in recreational, but may want to invest in medicinal or others that don't want to touch the plant at all and want to stay ancillary. So we put the fund together. We're moving ahead now and, and uh, really having a great time in this industry. So looking forward to seeing some great companies here. Thank you. All right. Well, that's our, our full panel of judges. So let's bring on the companies. Uh, up first, we have Alex Budigalong, the Chief Scientific Officer of Levadura Biotechnology. Um, just as a reminder, again, five minutes per presentation, four minutes for Q&A. And uh, I think we're just getting everything teed up right now. So Alex, um, Whenever you're ready, I'm not sure if you're unmuted at this point, but it looks like they're getting you pretty well set up here. There, can you hear me? Yes, great. Okay. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, for uh, Morgan and, and the judges for being here and the attendees, of course. Uh, my name is Alex Hutagalung, and today I'll tell you about Levadura Biotechnology. Uh, which will be the go-to provider of cannabinoids for the changing cannab uh, cannabis market. Oops. There it is. Oh. I was at the end of my, there it is. Uh, let's start with our team. As CEO with a PhD in biochemistry, I bring the technical expertise of yeast genetic engineering and industrial biotech while Brian and Matt lead business development, finance, and healthcare. Strategy and finance. The three of us have worked together extensively and have taken an industrial biotech process from concept to commercialization. So what are we going to do for the cannabis market? We all know the cannabis market will be huge and the non-flower market segments like concentrates and edibles are expected to be worth billions of dollars in the next two years. Both of these markets rely on a consistent and high quality source of purified cannabinoids. Pharmaceutical applications of cannabis are expected to be worth over $5 billion in the next seven years as well. Unfortunately, there's a problem. Consistency in chemical composition is one of the greatest challenges to plant-based drug development. Uh, which leads to the question, how will the market efficiently source pure and consistent cannabinoids uh, for these applications? I think we all agree that the cannabis plant is amazing and provides benefits unlike any other plant. However, as a means of cannabinoid production, there's lots of room for improvement. The whole process takes several months with growing being the rate limiting step. It's a labor, water and energy intensive process requiring a large footprint, which if you're outdoors is subject to the weather and normal agriculture, agriculture related environmental issues, as well as all the issues that Chris Booth from Theracan raised. When it comes to extraction and purification, there are numerous substances that need to be removed. Mold, lipids and waxes, pesticides, heavy metals, and aflatoxins just to start. The end result is an often inconsistent cannabinoid mixture based on the plant and the quality of the crop. Levadura solves all these problems. Our expertise lies in our ability to genetically engineer yeast for a, fer for a fermentation process. Each engineered yeast will produce one cannabinoid in a one week fermentation and purification cycle. Production will require a small footprint and will be a sterile and highly controlled process in fermentation times. All this without the known plant-based contaminants. Why is this important? Because levadura as a means of production can make a big difference to your bottom line. Plant-based production of cannabinoids is handicapped by the time, usually several months, it takes to get product. The only way to increase output is to have better plants or more space. Furthermore, as you will hear from Zach at Polar Extracts today, extraction can be a bottleneck to cannabinoid production. The result, cost of manufacturing for a kilogram of cannabinoid, in this case THC, on the order of thousands. The advantage of a levadura process is its speed and flexibility. A one-week production cycle allows for more than 50 cycles a year to ensure flexibility to market demands. A production facility can be located in a small warehouse with enough capacity to produce 50 to 75 kilos of product with each run. And at the end of our fully funded development timeline, we expect to be able to produce a purified cannabinoid 
at around $350 a kilo. As a technology company, one of our key components is our intellectual property. We have recently filed a US patent to protect the core of our technology shown below. The key advantage of our approach is how we engineer yeast to convert the input, in our case, vegetable oil, to the output, a cannabinoid. And I'll elaborate on that here. Any kind of vegetable oil is composed of triglycerides. Each triglyceride is composed of one molecule of glycerol and three fatty acids. It's the fatty acid component that is valuable for our technology, which I show you here with the tail portion highlighted in red. By genetically engineering our yeast to control how they consume fatty acids, we have developed proof of concept production of CBGA, THCA, and the cannabinoid precursor, olivitolic acid. I've highlighted where the red tail ends up on a mature cannabinoid. I'll tell you more about why that's important on the next slide. By controlling how much of the fatty acid tail we leave behind, we can make rare cannabinoids, such as those of the for all class, which I show you here, with a longer tail shown in green. THCP is found naturally in the plant and has recently been shown to be 33 times more active than THC through binding to the CB1 receptor. Our approach also allows for producing novel cannabinoids. Most plant-based oils contain unsaturated fatty acids, such as oleic, with one unsaturation, which is a major component of canola oil, and linoleic with two unsaturations, which is found in sunflower oil. By producing cannabinoids with unusual tails from these fatty acids, the technology would be ideal for pharma applications. To provide some context, I'm showing you the structure of adulamic acid or lenabasum in the drug pipeline of Corbis Pharmaceuticals. Notice its unusual tail. It's at phase two or phase three trials for several diseases whereby inflammation is a critical component of their pathologies. This brings me to our ask. Yeah, just about five minutes, okay? Yep. Uh, this brings me to our ask. Based on the progress of our seed round, we are raising two million for our Series A, which will be used to produce the following goals. Purified CBGA for commercial development, production of CBDA and THCA in fermenters, development of commercial partnerships, and the granting of our U.S. patent, and research to support new patent applications. The pie chart shows use of funds during that time, the bulk of it going to personnel, supplies, and equipment. I'll stop here and take questions. Great, thank you. Okay, judges, got about four minutes, so uh, try to keep it to one a person. I'm sure I continue sharing the screen. I'm happy to kick off. Um, really interesting presentation. Uh, I really loved the uh, the slide you had regarding extraction versus their process and then the cost implications. What what is the the capex requirements and sort of the licensing requirements to 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 do the process? Uh, it so for uh, at the cost at the cost of goods of about three hundred fifty dollars a kilo. Uh, I'm, we're talking about our own production facility there, where we would be doing fermentation and extraction all within a uh, all within one facility, and the capex for that kind of a facility would be somewhere around ten million. Uh, um, for those kinds of yields that we discussed in that slide there. Great. And do you need a, a cannabis, like an operating license to do so? Or a DE? I, I believe so. Uh, I, at this stage, um, I'm, not, I'm not so sure what the licensing needs will be at this stage uh, because this is a kind of an unusual process within the whole uh, uh, production workflow of producing cannabinoids, which generally applies to the flower and the plant. So now coming from a uh, uh, biosynthetic source, uh, um, it's not exactly clear to me at this stage what those requirements will be. Uh, um, and hopefully, uh, you know, we'll get, have, get some light shed on that as we as we continue down the process. Uh, hi, Alex, that was a uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, clearly very interesting stuff. What is the like plan and timeline to bringing this to market look like? Uh, based on from where you are, what are the kind of milestones and timeline associated with this? So for, uh, so I'll, I'll just speak about what we're trying to do for our series A. Uh, for that particular um, raise, uh, we again are focused on uh, making CBGA at quantities sufficient for uh, commercial development. And that just means that we're providing samples uh, to uh, any interested parties that would like to uh, see the quality and, our, and, uh, and nature of our CBG that we're producing. Uh, and the timeline for what we're saying for our Series A is about a year to a year and a half. Uh, um, and at that point in time, um, it, it's not clear to me what the market demand is for CBG at this stage. Uh, I know it has some some traction within the marketplace, but it's not a significant player right now. 
uh, that could, I have no idea what that's going to look like in a year and a half. Uh, uh, but we believe at that point in time, um, what we are planning to do is the next go to go to our next raise. Uh, but because we've been able to demonstrate that we are able to make CBGA, we envision a, a, a inflection in value uh, whereby uh, we'll need the, the additional money to start developing production of CBDA and THCA, uh, which will be, uh, of course, uh, commercially relevant within the marketplace uh, today. Uh, and that timeline is about two years. So total timeline from including Series A all the way through the development of CBD and THCA at commercial scale in fermenters, we, uh, we see a timeline of about two and a half to three years. Alex, this is... That, a year and a half from now, I, I have no idea if CBGA will have uh, uh, any type of significant presence in the marketplace. And if we're commercially... Uh, if we had a commercial production scale or level for CBGA, then then there's there's chances for commercialization there as well. So it's a good presentation. I've seen a couple uh, companies similar to this trying to get that consistency down, highlighting a couple of things that uh, you said that that were spot on. I, obviously, you identified the goals and you knew what the investor audience wanted with the uh, IP. Uh, you understand the market. What I'd like to know is about needs and roadblocks. You kind of mentioned what sets the business apart, having rare cannabinoids, which is important with consistency uh, and accurate dosing, I would throw in there as well. Um, added the team and products and created a summary with call to action. But what I want to know is more about what sets you apart and some of the needs and roadblocks that you might face to differentiate you from a competitor. Right. So um, the there are a number of biosynthetic competitors within this uh, within this uh, marketplace, uh, which you've highlighted, Josh. Uh, what's unusual about our approach is the IP that we're talking about, and that we're going from fatty acids to cannabinoids. And uh, it, I, I don't want to dive into the the, the the biosynthetic pathway, but there are there are metabolic advantages in doing that. And by doing that, uh, what we envision is ultimately there's uh, there's going to be a, a higher productivity for our process. And it, in, in the, the actual theoretical yield of a cannabinoid from a fatty acid is higher than the, the traditional route of a biosynthetic approach, which is from sugar. So by having this higher yield, I think our, our, we see our advantages are in the productivity of a fermentation, which allows for a one-week cycle in a typical fermentation, which allows for a, a, sig a significant number of production runs each year, which ultimately is what's going to drive down cost of manufacturing because it's that it's that productivity or increased productivity, which is one of the significant factors in how much it's going to cost to actually make a cannabinoid uh, um, within a within a, a certain amount of time, uh, based on the input of labor and materials and utilities and uh, capex or depreciation of capex, uh, dividing all those costs by uh, how much product you're able to make in a certain amount of time is really what's going to drive down that cost of manufacturing. So that's what we see as our major advantage moving forward. Great. Having said that, you know, you know, we need the funding to, to really, uh, uh, to make that a reality. So, uh, but, but that's what we see as our major advantage. Thank you, Alex. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, we, uh, we will be transitioning to the next uh, speaker, Alex, just so you know, and, and for all the presenters, uh, there are more questions that are coming in in the chat and also in the, uh, in the Q&A. So you definitely want to take a look at that um, because there's um, certainly biotech, I think, is a, a very curious category. Um, so there's some good questions to check out there. Thank you, Alex. Thank uh, you. Up next, uh, we have uh, Bob Craig, who is the CEO of PayQuick. And uh, we'll get him set up here. So uh, just all the attendees appreciate all the questions. I do see them coming in. Uh, just trying to make sure we're staying mindful of the of the clock here, so we can give everyone a, a fair chance to do their presentation, and um, and let the judges ask their questions. Same thing for judges. Um, be mindful of your other. Uh, judges to uh, get their questions in as well. So uh, there will be some more time later on. There is networking afterwards as well. So there's plenty more time to dig in. So again, up next, we have uh, Bob Craig from PayQuick. Uh, they're just getting his presentation set up. Um, no, not sure if there's, there we go. Perfect. Bob, are you? 
Yeah, I'm ready to go. Great. Can you okay. See? Over to you. You can see the screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Morgan. Uh, here to introduce to you guys Pay Quick Financial Network. Um, and uh, as many of you are, are well aware, running a cannabis business in a uh, newly regulated industry uh, is very, very difficult. Uh, marrying that with banking, which is also highly regulated uh, and really hasn't figured out the rules of, uh, of what to do in cannabis uh, uh, is, uh, is also challenging. So uh, putting the two together, uh, running a cannabis business and then trying to manage your money uh, and, uh, and all the things that you want to do from a financial perspective, very difficult. So PayQuick is uh, part of the solution there. Um, our mission is to provide a comprehensive solution that uh, is compliant and also pulls together all the uh, functional things that a company needs to, to manage their, their cash, uh, make their payroll, uh, do treasury operations, et cetera. Our vision is that we will create this network effect uh, and will help the industry grow. PayQuick is a little different than other companies that, uh, that are in this business. We are a direct banking solution to the cannabis industry. We're backed by national banks and local banks as well to give us access to the Federal Reserve and other systems like that. Uh, we have an executive team with a deep experience in payments and in cannabis. So what we're doing is we're providing that expertise to companies that are trying to build their business, grow their business, manage their supply chain uh, across the cannabis industry. We're serving all, my, uh, all license types uh, and specifically focused on MSOs. And we've built a technology platform that uh, that delivers compliance as a service, not only to the customers, but also to, uh, to the banks that, uh, that we work with. Uh, the executive team, my, uh, I consider myself a payment geek. I'm a banker from way back, um, worked at very large banks uh, and also in fintech companies, um, working on uh, how to uh, leverage new technology uh, into emerging businesses. Uh, Keith Marks is also on the, uh, on the screen with us. Um, He's uh, coming from Riverside County over with, uh, with Cheech. He's also wearing the, uh, the, the flag uh, like I've got on here. Keith was our founder uh, back in 2014 and is the visionary uh, around PayQuick. Also on our board is also an investor that many of you guys know, uh, David Friedman, uh, who is the CEO of Panther Capital uh, and also is running some other um, businesses in the cannabis space as well. He has a long history of cannabis business. So as you guys know, cannabis uh, and banking have not, uh, have not always met on, on uh, uh, even keel. Um, and what we've seen is many, many banks have gotten into the business, uh, some to quickly uh, escape uh, as they realized how difficult it was. Um, what we're seeing is banks having a partial solution in here um, and maybe not always uh, the most compliant solution. So PayQuick is there to, uh, to do that. Our financial network uh, crosses all of the things that a business may need from consumer payments, uh, the core treasury solutions, settlement solutions for labs and exchanges and marketplaces, um, and also investment solutions for those that are uh, compiling cash. Uh, for those that are not compiling cash, but they're looking for uh, short-term, medium-term, and long-term loans, uh, we have partners that we work with to build that into the capability for all of our customers. Uh, as I mentioned before, our target market is, is, uh, is all license types. Um, we work uh, around the, the supply chain to help uh, every, every kind of business uh, transact with each other uh, in a compliant manner. So they can move money uh, from each other, they can move invoices, et cetera, et cetera, uh, so that they can pay each other and settle their obligations. It helps for recurring business. Uh, as more people are on the PayQuick network, uh, more people will transact on the PayQuick network. Uh, the core products that we offer from a banking perspective include receivables, payables. Uh, we have a nat nationwide network uh, so that you can uh, manage your businesses on a state-by-state -state basis, as well as a roll-up for MSOs looking at uh, their business across multiple states. As I uh, alluded to before, we do something that we call quick pays, which is electronic invoicing and payment. Really very important for the B2B um, uh, solution set um, for transacting and solidifying uh, the, the um, supply chain movement. Um, <laughs> this, uh, this, this is uh, where PayQuick exists right now uh, in the green states. This looks very much like the map that Emily put up earlier. Um, and what you can see is that we're focused primarily on states where uh, adult use has, uh, has been 
uh, enacted uh, in a law. Um, we talk a little bit about our addressable market. Uh, California, obviously the largest market to, uh, uh, in, the, in the country, uh, last year did about $3 billion in uh, transactions. Um, and our deposits last year in California were about 200 million. So we're running about 7% of that market. Uh, we're expanding broadly into other states uh, that are coming online. Uh, Nevada, Florida, and New Jersey, very important for us uh, as we expand in uh, 2020 and 2021. You just Part passed five minutes, just so you know. Okay. Partnerships are very important to us. The company that you keep, a lot to build that we did uh, to, uh, to work with these partners. Um, a little bit about of our revenue model. We uh, charge fees very, very much like a, a bank would. Um, our costs are fixed and variable people, as well as uh, fees from our banks to uh, access the Federal Reserve, et cetera. Uh, we have been in business for a long time. We have a very strong uh, growth, especially uh, this year. Uh, our growth has been phenomenal. We're doing um, about 350 million in national deposits right now. We expect that to continue to grow for the rest of the year, uh, leaving us with about 5 million in revenue uh, and an EBITDA positive. There's some uh, transaction volume. We are, uh, uh, we're very proud of uh, how much we've done. Uh, and as I say in the investment world, the dogs are eating the dog food uh, to multiple transactions, deposits, uh, et cetera. We're looking for $5 million for growth. Here's a pie chart of where we're gonna spend that growth uh, in expanding across the US and investing in more sales as well as more network opportunities. Key parts of our, our, our business leadership team, uh, a moat of five years being in this business, uh, compliant money transmission licenses across the country, um, and uh, the uh, top MSOs, compliant technology, and a supply chain network uh, integration that, uh, that helps the business grow. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Okay, uh, judges. Uh, I, I have a quick question, uh, Morgan. Um, so Bob, for the five million raise, um, <clears throat> what's the minimum tranche you're looking for and how are you setting up, um, what kind of investment is it exactly? You doing a note, is it doing debt? Like what is exactly, how are you setting that up, Bob? Uh, we're thinking that it's gonna be equity um, and uh, we're um, looking for participation from uh, a number of different in investors. Uh, could be two or three. Uh, we're going first to our existing investors, obviously for, uh, or follow on to their original investments. Um, but we would love strategics uh, to come in as well. But your short answer is it's equity. And how much equity are you uh, looking to give up for the 5 million? Uh, I think it's, uh, I think some of that's uh, negotiable as we, uh, as we look at uh, the current valuation. Thank you. Hey, Bob, you mentioned um, that you're, um, you have some integration with the Fed and the other banks. Um, how are you handling wires and that sort of thing? Yeah, we're supported by um, national banks and also some state banks and credit unions. Um, and so they give us access to, uh, to the back end on that. So we are a direct bank relationship to our customers. Uh, and then we have access to the Federal Reserve through our bank partners. Uh, we're not reselling their product. They're not, uh, you know, opening accounts for the bank, for the uh, MSOs or the MRBs. Uh, that's all on the PayQuick platform. Thanks. Hey, hey Bob, how you doing? Uh, this is Evan. Uh, seen you guys grow now for a couple years, so congratulations on all the success. Um, how you. how many active clients do you have, and and where do you see the growth within your sales process for additional clients? And are they primarily commercial clients, or do you also provide consumer uh, solutions as well? Yeah, great question and appreciate your uh, awareness of PayQuick's uh, history. Uh, in the beginning, we were, um, and Forbes magazine actually called us the PayPal of pot. Uh, and about a year and a half ago, we came back to and said, uh, consumer programs are very, very hard. You know, Capital One, Citibank, uh, Bank of America does, uh, does, does consumer programs. And the compliance around those is even tougher um, as you're doing a stored value or trying to take credit cards related to consumer transactions. So we've partnered with uh, folks that are doing consumer-based transactions for retailers. But what we saw in our customer base was this uh, vertically integrated uh, uh, types of companies uh, and also multi-state operators. So we leveraged the platform, which was already doing those uh, payment and other banking transactions 
to expand and to serve those customers. So we're working with cultivators all the way to retailers, uh, as well as ancillary businesses, packaging, uh, et cetera. Um, so yeah, our focus on consumers is really to help those that are uh, aligned with consumers in terms of a product for the cannabis industry, um, for those of our customers that have um, retail dispensary and, uh, and other retail applications. Bob, real quick, before we have time for one more question, can you just unshare your screen when you have a moment? Share. Un unshare it. Unshare. There you go. There you go. Perfect. Judges, one, we got time for one last quick one. I guess I'd like to know in the eventuality with uh, federal legalization, what's, what's the game plan with that? looks like your biggest competitors are ADP and a bank. Um, and so how do you kind of ease investor uh, uncertainty with financial legalization and your ability to continue as a going concern? Yeah, great question. Again, um, one of the things that we're trying to focus on primarily is, you know, how do we serve those banks that are looking to get into the space um, so we can help them um, with, without needing them to learn the, the five years of history that we have. Uh, we can actually help people enter the, the space by using our platform, our automated compliance, our money transmission licenses, et cetera. So uh, it'd be very, very, very hard to build this uh, if, you know, the administration's Sounds like, Bob, you cut out there a little bit. So I'm going to jump in to, to try and, and I think, Josh, that was your question, uh, and try and finish off uh, for Bob. Our, our platform is really built in order to work with banks and other financial institutions. Uh, PayQuick is really more than anything a B2B compliance company. Our onboarding and ongoing maintenance uh, of, of the transactions is very difficult to build and scale. Uh, it's very expensive for smaller institutions and banks to get into this business and build what we've been able to do to electronically triangulate um, the transactions, to verify uh, what's going through, to do all the AML BSA reporting. Um, smaller institutions really can't do that. Um, and even some of the larger ones, it's very difficult to put together those platforms. We've built that out and believe that our platform, regardless of, of federal legalization or not, is always going to have this compliance requirement and that we will become a very integral part to all of the different banks or credit unions that want to be in business as being that transactional partner that's doing all the reporting and the transactions. Thank you, Keith. Okay. Appreciate the, the time, guys. Uh, we are going to move on to our next presentation. Uh, and hopefully, Bob, you're... You still look a little bit frozen, just so you know for when, uh, <laughs> for later on. Yeah. Um, up next, oh, there you go, you're better now. Uh, up next, we have uh, Davina uh, Kanoe, uh, CEO and co-founder of Element Apothic. Yeah. I'm just getting everything ready. We can hear you just fine. Yeah, it looks All like right. your screen is coming up right now, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hi, how's everybody doing today? So I'm Davina, the CEO and co-founder of Element Apothic. Element Apothic is really a new disruptive brand in the CBD space, meeting the needs of today's conscious consumer, bringing the intersection of the need for clean beauty and wellness products into the CBD space. And our mission is really to enrich lives by creating clean, safe, and effective products, combining science with the healing power of nature. And as you can see, my story with the plant started a long time ago. I grew up realizing the benefits of this plant early on. My dad was a Vietnam veteran and would tell me Pakalolo, as they call it in Hawaii, without it, that he couldn't leave the house, that he couldn't sleep. And so I've always believed in the medicinal values of the plant. And today I'm so excited to be bringing Element Apothic. We were born in a kitchen, not a lab. And when my aunt was diagnosed with several medical conditions, she realized that the she needed to put in and on her body 
were not meeting her needs. She went on a mission to understand plant-based medicine and cannabis and everything that could possibly help her. Today, we're bringing those products that she created over 40 custom formulations that helped herself and countless others from the kitchen into the world. The problem is, is that most consumers today don't know who or what to trust. As we all know, CBD holds a lot of promise, but so many brands are not living up to it. Personal care products are filled with toxins and harmful ingredients. There are low quality products flooding the market, not just in CBD, but in the personal care space with little to no transparency. Many products have no oversight and there's often an absence of ingenuity with minimal product variation with so many white labeled products on the market. The solution is Element Apothic, the trustworthy brand that conscious consumers are demanding. We're bringing clean and safe products to the market with complete transparency. All of our formulations have been reformulated with medical and scientific oversight, and we're using other phytocannabinoids, not just CBD, but CBG and CBN into the mix of our products to make them as effective as possible. Our never ever promise means that we will never ever use any harmful or toxic ingredients in the products we create. And that's really important to today's consumer. Not only are we bringing great products, but we're committed to providing consumer education as well. We've assembled a team of over 60 years relevant experience in the CPG, e-commerce space, as well in the medical cannabis space. This includes Dr. Swathi, who is our chief science officer, is also an integrative pharmacist and works with universities across the US, introducing cannabis into traditional pharmacology for students to incorporate that. We also have our chief medical advisor, Dr. Marvin Singh, who's a dual certified medical integrative doctor to provide that medical oversight that is really needed in this space today. And how does Element Apothic stack up? We know there are hundreds of companies in this space, but we truly feel that we are meeting the needs of today's consumer. And the market opportunity, as, as everybody here knows, is, is huge. It's expected to grow to $16 billion by 2022. But not only are we focused on the CBD market and hemp-based market, we really tap into the wellness market with a $3.5 trillion market reach in this space. So we feel we're positioned to have an incredible opportunity. We're, we do have aggressive financial plans, but we expect that we will be able to meet those and far exceed those with an omni-channel sales approach, direct to consumer, as well as B2B, and also licensing some of the formulations that we have. We have um, hit several milestones to date. We are ready to launch with six products. We're beginning our online sales in the next 30 days. We do have several retail commitments already including a new store called Showcase by Cal Ethos. We've also received Cert Clean certification already and are working on other certifications. And we've established key partnerships, including Tag One for transparency, showing all of our ingredients from the beginning all the way until it gets into the consumer's hands. We are currently raising $500,000 as a convertible note and anybody can invest from $100 all the way up to $107,000. You may be asking yourself, why Element Apothic, especially in a market that has so many other brands? It's trust, plain and simple. Invest now and join us on our journey to set a new standard for clean science. Element Apothic, never ever anything but good. Perfect timing. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, judges, you can feel free to ask away. Davina, may I ask you a question? Yes. <laughs> Just checking to see if you can hear me. So one thing you um, recognize right off the bat is how to establish is that you have a huge issue with consumer trust. How do you think you can establish consumer trust against brands such as Aveda, which have a, a pretty good reputation in the marketplace, or any other established brand where folks have come to trust that brand? I mean, I think a lot of it is through education. We're already starting that with our social media and influencers, but also building the team with the focus on medical and science education and back 
provide the insight. And, and really, it comes down to consumer awareness because I think people, especially consumers, don't understand all of the ingredients that they're putting in and on their body and educating people. And there's over 1,400 toxic ingredients that are banned in Europe and Canada that are allowed here in personal care products that people use every single day. And so a lot of that is really educating people in terms of how to read your labels, how do you know what products are trustworthy or not trustworthy? And how do we elevate not just the CBD space, but have higher requirements for the personal care space in general? A follow-up question. So you put a lot of uh, stock in education. Do you have an education plan beyond social media platforms? Yes, we do. We actually are um, just got started a show on a, on a channel called Razzle. Um, that we're going to be, it's a cannabis network doing a show called Contemporary Cannabis. And a lot of that is really educating, not just on cannabis and CBD, but just in terms of ingredients and, and products in general. Uh, we are assembling a team of writers to build out a knowledge base as well, um, and not depending just on social media, but utilizing that as an access point to disseminate information. I have, I have a follow-up to what Sherry just asked. Um, as someone who is in the medical field by trade and still invest in medical companies, they have uh, qualified CEUs right now for CBD education. Um, and for your raise, one, are you targeting any type of medical practitioners? And two, for the education, are you going to do what some other CBD companies are doing and trying to get some certified CEUs to offer physicians and other healthcare uh, practitioners? It's something that we started to consider and explore. We haven't looked at it in terms of that much depth, but it's definitely something that we have kind of put on to the, the thought process in terms of how do we actually elevate ourselves in the educational, medical, and scientific aspects of it. Um, so again, it's not something that we've actually done yet, but it is something that we are exploring at this point. Where, where do you manufacture <laughs> this and how, how do you scale it? Um, and great presentation. Yes, right. So our um, our manufacturer is based in Utah. Um, we have a capacity to scale um, as as large as we we need. We can produce from a thousand products to several thousand products a day if needed to be able to meet the demands of the consumer, as well as with our three PL um, shipping and logistics facility as well. Thank you, Davina. Can you just do me a favor and unshare your screen? Uh, and then uh, we have time for one last quick question. Hey, this is Frank said, I, I have a question, Davina, a great presentation. Uh, I do know that with, uh, with anything within the health and beauty space, it's obviously very intensive capital wise for marketing. Uh, and your guys are asking for half a million dollars. Um, how do you guys plan to deploy that, taking the marketing into, um, into account? Yeah, we've already started to put together a pretty um, strong marketing plan. We're working with the current marketing agency um, now. And so a big portion of the raise actually is going specifically to marketing because we understand that in order to create a presence that we need to invest a lot in that aspect. Um, and so that will continue. We expect that the 500000 will last us approximately six months for our runway um, and at that point, needing to go back and raise an, a, lar a larger, um, you know, raise um, as we need to scale both in product innovation, R&D, as well as uh, marketing. Great. What was the name of the marketing uh, company? Uh, uh, we're working with uh, Circle Media Marketing um, for now, but we're looking to expand um, as well and talking to a, a couple other companies specifically in the cannabis space that understand some of the challenges that we are currently facing with advertising. Great, okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Davina. Make sure to uh, follow the chats. So I did see some questions coming through over there as well. Um, up next, we have Josh Snyder, CEO of the Neva Labs. Okay, thank you everyone uh, for, here we go, let me get the, the slide deck. Um, Okay, yep, thank you, uh, Brad. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today um, about our company, the Neva Labs. Um, our company has two major focuses. The first is the Neva Labs, which is a contract, or I'm sorry, a uh, California licensed cannabis testing lab. We're located in Los Angeles. And the second uh, major thrust of our company is 
a contract research division, which is serving pharmaceutical biotech as well as cannabis and CBD companies. And our mission really is to provide excellent testing to the California cannabis market and CBD market. Also, we provide uh, product development services to um, the product development support for cannabis and CBD companies and then brand elevating research for the industry too. And what really makes us different is the focus on quality, um, customer service and collaborative partnerships where we're helping to solve problems, uh, not just do testing. Um, we also have uh, the best technology available and we're very unique in that uh, two thirds of our team has advanced degrees and uh, accomplished research backgrounds. So the opportunity for testing is, you know, a $4 billion um, in growing market in cannabis in California. Um, estimated revenues for testing labs last year were about $100 million. Um, and we also can test uh, products for CBD, hemp, nutraceutical, and food and beverage industries. Now, the second opportunity is contract research. And our clients are pharma and biotech companies um, who have an annual budget of about $190 billion globally for research. And 25% of that is outsourced to contract research labs like ours. And that number is growing rapidly. The outsourcing trend is continuing, continuing with 11% annual growth in that market. And so we have four major revenue streams. In the early days, um, cannabis testing is what we've always anticipated to be our major revenue stream. Um, however, that could change very quickly. Um, we have hemp and CBD testing, consulting revenues, and the contract research um, we anticipate becoming by far the biggest uh, source of revenue going forward with the potential for, for a total of 74 million annual revenue uh, by 2024 for the company. Um, we're unique again because most labs derive all or most of their revenue from testing. However, we're much more diversified. We have contract research, consulting, and other uh, revenue streams. And of course, every lab, every testing lab provides testing. Um, a few provide troubleshooting and even fewer help companies with product development. Um, but what makes us very unique is that we provide research for cannabis and CBD companies, and those are paid contracts. Um, we've, we've already had uh, good traction in that area. And um, I don't know of any other testing lab that's also doing uh, supporting drug development in pharmas and biotechs. So that's, that's where we really set ourselves apart. So our background, um, you know, comes from, we come from cannabis testing, contract research, pharma and biotech, and cancer drug development. That's what I was doing before I, I founded the company. And we have, uh, again, PhDs with, with uh, very accomplished research backgrounds. And the sales team we've brought on very recently has had excellent, excellent traction, really getting us going on sales. Um, and you can see here, um, for the testing revenue here at the top, we're in kind of exponential growth phase. We received our license from the BCC in April. And since then, our revenue is increasing very quickly, especially since we, we just brought on the new, the new sales team, um, who's got us going in, in the right direction here, uh, we believe. And contract research um, has, re has been solely me uh, bringing in some clients. I've signed about 172,000 in studies. Um, that's been increasing very quickly. The month of July has been already our, by far our best quarter um, with another 100,000 100, in proposals pending. Um, and we also see this as perfect time for market entry too in the cannabis testing market because we learned from mistakes of other labs. Um, you know, we, we saw some, some things go wrong with the labs. We saved money and time uh, from those lessons. And then we've also avoided pitfalls of early licensing um, some labs had problems with uh, not being able to meet the requirements of, um, of compliance for the state and having damaged reputations or, or being suspended. Um, and we also, during the, uh, the pre-launch phase, we developed a number of services that other labs typically don't have. Um, and what we've seen really bottom line is that we've, we're offering uh, some services that the market's been missing, um, which you can see in some testimonials here. We've worked with several major brands um, and these companies have all really been at a lack to find a good research partner that is also a testing lab. So um, we found a good niche for ourselves here. And so to date, all of our funding has come from a single family um, and revenue that we've generated so far. And we're 
We're looking to raise uh, 2 million in additional funding to grow the business rapidly. We see opportunities to, to really accelerate our, our uh, research area of the company. We've seen a number of demand for some of our newer service offerings lately. Um, and you know, that, that funding, two thirds approximately would go to equipment and then sales and marketing and, and new hires being the other, the other uh, sources or uses for funds. So that's, right. that's all I have. Thank you very much. I answer any questions. Thank you, Josh. Um, I'll go. So great presentation, Josh. Um, we are work with a, a number, number of parties that uh, you engage and uh, I saw testimonials from, so um, that's mm -hmm. great. Um, going back to the, yeah, totally. The 10% the of the market via 24 um, with a $74 million you know, revenue by then, can you sort of break down what your thoughts are on, you know, what what audience that's going to come from? Is that going to be derived um, mostly from from research parties where you're assisting them on the product development side, um, or the sort of more traditional, you know, potency and you know microbial tests and otherwise? Sure. So that that seventy four million dollar number on total revenue is we're estimating about two thirds of that or more to come from the, the research with probably the biggest source of that coming from pharma and biotech. Um, we've also had you know, cannabis and CBD companies that, that are a significant uh, source of that contract research revenue too. And about, about a, a quarter to a third from testing. And then um, on top of that, Josh, uh, myself, I used to have a test lab in Vegas, uh, Denver. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. For your budget, how much of your budget are you gonna actually put towards the lobbyist because one of the big issues in testing is you have a lot of growers that are anti-testing due to the cost of it. So mm -hmm. how much of that budget of the money you're raising actually can put towards the lobbyists to make sure that testing requirements are enforced and actually get increased over time as well too? Um, sure, that's, you know, I don't, I don't have a number for you offhand what that number needs to be. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's a little bit out of my area. Um, that would be probably a good question for, for our uh, sales and marketing team. Okay, answer. no problem, uh, thank you though. Hey, hey, Josh, question for you. I mean, you have the analytical lab, which provides some revenue today. It doesn't seem like that's really a major focus for you and your growth. Is that an accurate statement? You're really focused on your contract research and, and biotech development, pharma development? Well, I think that's the biggest opportunity, you know, long term. However, I'm not, I'm definitely not uh, minimizing the opportunity with testing. Um, it is, it is a, a very good opportunity too. We're just devoting uh, two different teams and sets of sets of equipment, and ultimately two two different spaces um, to those two different efforts. So um, my my projection is that you know in the next year testing is probably a little bit bigger, but a couple of years from now research is bigger. Yeah, I mean just with that as a follow up, your your ten percent of the market's a very large percentage of the market in a segment that is probably not where you're going to focus most of your time and attention. I would maybe focus on the area that you see the, the fastest and, and uh, you know, greatest opportunity for you guys. Uh, it's just, it jumped out at me, to me as maybe not where you're focusing your time anyway. Right, sure. Well, yeah, I personally spend a lot more of my time on the research side, but, but our lab director is 100% on the, the testing side. So. Josh, there are a number of CROs in the United States and Canada that have um, relatively good track records. How, um, as a new CRO, do you uh, see yourself competing? Sure, so the, the major source of business so far is from my, from really from my network, from, uh, contract, re from contract research um, and pharma and biotech. So that's, that's already a, a very good base for us to draw on, but, um, but going forward, we do need to uh, we're forming partnerships with other CROs. We're getting a lot of referrals that way. And we're also um, going to be dedicating marketing and sales efforts. That's part of, part of what the raise is for too, um, to that. And, and we also position ourselves as a niche CRO because we're, we're taking on, you know, smaller CROs are able to, to provide better attention to more difficult projects. Um, that's where we come in. And we're also catering, especially to any pharmas uh, doing cannabinoid drug development and um, we'll have some other niches for, for um, cancer drug development where we have specialized expertise too. Great. Well, thank you, Josh. Uh, okay. Very interesting. Uh, 
And uh, thank you for sharing your screen already. <laughs> Up next, we have uh, Mike Simpson, CEO of Omura. And just again, a reminder, I have seen some chats, uh, with some additional questions, so uh, make sure to check those out. Uh, some Q&A as well. Um, so it's always good to keep mind of those, some good questions. Hi guys. Hi Brad and hi judges. Thanks very much for being here today. Um, I assume you can hear me okay? Good to go. Brilliant. If you don't mind, I'm gonna start with a very quick demo and then I'm gonna move, brilliant. Uh, <laughs> my virtual device. So it'll be an interesting demo with the green screen. Uh, and then I'm gonna go into a, the slides. So I'll be very quick. So my name's Mike Simpson. I'm a co-founder and CEO of Amura. Amura is the next generation platform for the consumption of whole flower cannabis and hemp CBD. I spent 10 years in Tokyo uh, designing uh, and inventing new technologies for harm reduction for big tobacco and then five years in, in California research in the cannabis industry for big tobacco. So I've been living this uh, area called heat not burn for a long time. Now heat not burn is actually taking over the tobacco market driven by the IFOS device by Philip Morris, uh, which is launched in the US now and actually just been given the FDA approval for a harm reduction marketing. Uh, Amura is bringing uh, heat not burn, clean, convenient uh, consumption to the cannabis market, essentially. So a quick uh, demo. The uh, product itself is uh, <laughs> comprised of sticks and a device. Uh, it's, it's very easy to use. You get one of the flower sticks uh, with cannabis inside and you place the flower stick inside the device. The device starts automatically. You can see uh, that it's heating up by itself. Uh, then within about 15, 20 seconds, you can simply use the device by sucking on the flower stick uh, and you only inhale cannabinoids and terpenes. And then when you finish the session, you simply remove the stick and put the stick in the trash. No cleaning required whatsoever. So let me just share my screen uh, now. Okay, um, the Amura platform. So we believe that the future is about whole flour. Everyone loves whole flour, but traditional forms of smoking like pre-rolls are unhealthy and unhygienic. Uh, and everyone loves a convenience of an oil vape pen, but their oil lacks provenance and the full flour entourage effect. Amura offers the best of both worlds, vape pen convenience with whole flour experience. We believe the future is whole flour using heat not burn. Amura flower sticks contain single strain, 100% whole flower cannabis with no leaves, trim, or additives. Uh, and using Amura's heat not burn heating system, they release all the cannabinoids and terpenes to deliver the full entourage effect. Uh, they also taste fantastic. Uh, we believe the future of cannabis is about control. Every flower stick contains a small but precise amount of whole flower, allowing the consumer to control their experience based on their tolerance. Amura has been designed to deliver a social high, one that keeps you in the room, enhancing the moment while leaving you in control. Fine tune your experience by layering sticks over an entire evening, like having a few glasses of wine. We believe the future is for a social high. Now the new consumers, according to New Frontier data, uh, the US market will double to around 30 billion in the next five years a large proportion of which will come from new users who haven't used cannabis or haven't used it for years anyway. Uh, these consumers who haven't developed a tolerance for THC are often worried about losing control or getting too high. To most of these new users, the idea of combustion or setting fire to produce smoke will not be desirable. Amura is a perfect product for this new user as it offers control, which is hygienic and extremely easy to use. So the benefits of our social high it uses flour and not oil. People like flour because it's natural. Amura combines the convenience of a vape pen with the benefits of a healthiest way to consume whole flour by simply heating it up. We have a controlled dose. Each flour stick contains an exact amount of pure whole flour, giving a reliable experience every time. And efficacy, studies show that the vaping whole flour is more efficacious for cannabinoid absorption than combustion. With heat not burn, you don't breathe in a huge cloud of smoke, you just inhale the pure cannabinoids and terpenes and your body retains most of them. 
Uh, this also means that Amura is perfect for indoors and outdoors as there's minimal vapor exhales. Uh, it's got a pleasant yet non-lingering smell. Uh, Amura is designed to be clean and hygienic with each flower stick serving as a mouthpiece for a single use, which is perfect in today's uh, COVID uh, climate. Also, no cleaning is required ever because the flower stick doesn't come into contact with the heat source ever. Also, the flower sticks are certified rainforest friendly, fully compostable and biodegradable. So our business model is very simple. Uh, we're not touching the plant company. Uh, we're a tech company. We work with flower brands where flower sticks are simply a line extension to their existing brand portfolio. We make our money from healthy margins on the sale of the devices, leasing our filling equipment, the sale of empty flower sticks and packaging, and the sale of our in-house CBD brands, also white labeling for, for third-party CBD brands. Uh, essentially, we're a razor blade model, and the return users is where our volume of pack sales really gets very interesting. Uh, we filed for a, a broad suite of internationally filed uh, intellectual property, covering every aspect of our platform. Thank um, you very much for five minutes, just so you know. Okay, and then just on the screen here is the THC brands that we're currently in market in California with, and our CBD brands as well. We select our partners to have a variety of different growing methods and target audiences. Uh, the CBD brands, there's two of our own brands there, Libertine, and two uh, white label CBD brands, Oho and Blue End as well. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Uh, judges? Hey, Mike, I have a question for you. Um, let's talk about cost uh, in, in making the, uh, the inputs there, the flower inputs. So um, obviously, consumers are going to look towards you know, costs as things get driven down. Um, those, those roles that you make there, manufacturing scale, maybe you can speak to that for a minute? Yeah, um, the sticks themselves, the empty sticks. Sorry, if you're talking about the empty sticks. Yes, yes, uh, it, yeah, the empty sticks, yeah, thanks. We've actually got three sources of production at the moment. We've got China, uh, US, and India. Currently, we're using the sticks made in India. Um, they're extremely cost-effective. Uh, the margins on our sticks are, I could tell you in a later discussion, they're pretty mind-blowing. Uh, our, our business model is obviously on the sale of the sticks. Whilst we do lease filling equipment, we do sell devices, it's actually the markup on the sticks is where the majority of our profit margin lay. Great, thanks. Very interesting product. Can you talk about the filling side and how that's done? Is this like a knock box? Do you, do you have equipment? Is there IP around that or? There's a lot actually. I, I can't show you very well on the screen here, but basically I developed a, a machine which fills 500 sticks in, in two minutes. Uh, it's it's a dissimilar technology to a knock box in the fact that uh, we, we, we spoke with Futurola and they couldn't help us because they only work with cones. Uh, I developed a technology where we can fill a parallel wall stick. And we have 500 of these sticks nested together. Uh, we go, it's a dual part process which finishes with a tamping process. It actually creates a porous plug inside the stick. The porous plug prevents the cannabis falling out, but it also adds a, a known amount of draw resistance to the product. Uh, we've got IP in the sticks. The, the filling of the sticks and that porous plug, also the filling equipment as well. Uh, also, we have IP in the device and we file for that internationally and uh, domestically. We've had our uh, international patent published already. And you said you're leasing the equipment, the filling equipment, or you're selling that? We, we lease the equipment to our flower partners sometimes for a nominal fee, and that's just so we can, uh, if we need to up update the equipment, that we can switch it out without them having the burden of an additional cost. Mike, this is Josh Kincaid. These are really hot in Europe and in Asia. I think the U.S. is a little bit slow to market. Even in Canada, they're really popular. But what I want to know about is, is the future integration with hardware software. Do you foresee the ability to have, uh, you said controlled dosing, but I want to know about accurate dosing as well as data aggregation. Are you able to have an app and have software? So if I hit something that you have and I want to know, oh, what's What's that that Mike had? I can go on the app and say, okay, this is this is what Mike was smoking and I want to download that and smoke it next time. Is there an ability to have data aggregation and accurate dosing down the road? Thanks, Josh. Great question. Yeah, there, there absolutely is. In my uh, previous life, I actually designed apps for Disney. Uh, so I've got a lot of experience in the, the data and digital side of it. Uh, we didn't want to integrate a new product, which is a new ritual uh, with a new technology on top of that because we thought it would be just overly... Uh, 
uh, confusing to the consumer. Also, there's an awful lot of turbulence in the, the app store at the moment with vapor-related apps, as many of us will know. Some people will have felt the pain. So we're very thankful that we didn't develop an app for this platform at the moment, but it's certainly in our development pipeline. One last quick question. Okay. Well, there are plenty of questions on the chat, Mike, so definitely take a look there. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, guys. Uh, I appreciate up it. next, we have Nick Easley, uh, Nick's CEO of uh, 3C Consulting. And while we're pulling him up, uh, Mike, I, I just wanted to mention to you that um, one of the last due diligence trips we did, uh, Poseidon, was our team was down in L.A., checking out a bunch of different retail stores and we're in the artistry where there was a very nice display of, of home mirror. So I thought that was very notable as that was one of my last trips. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Um, so we have Nick Easley, I believe is next unless there's a, a change of order here. Nick, you're unmuted and ready to go. Super duper. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Nice to uh, actually be on the other side of the equation. Um, also manage a few venture funds in the space um, with, with Multiverse. Um, 3C is originally kind of my, my baby. I accidentally started years ago and I'll get my screen up and Brad uh, said to wear a collared shirt. So I'm wearing my uh, undercover cowboy uniform up here in the high country of Colorado. After 10 years in suits, it's kind of nice to uh, take a little bit, bit of break um, and get real and, and focus on the company here. So I'll get my, uh, my screen up for everybody. Here we go. So just, just to run through, through a little bit, and I'll just kind of keep it open here. Um, you know, 3C, I originally started here in Colorado with uh, another company called 3E, Easily Environmental Engineering. That was back before cannabis was a cool thing to say. And most of you know me from like being in the industry now for well over a decade. And 3C is a company that when I started it with 3E was really helping the, the medical cannabis caregivers transition to the first legal compliant cannabis industry here in the United States that we've seen. Through that, I learned a lot of issues that operators have transitioning from that illicit side of the industry to the legal industry. And my main goals with my background, I was an airborne cryptolinguist for the United States Air Force speak a variety of languages, but uh, originally from farm country in Wisconsin. And I, I really love this plant, I'm a disabled vet, and I just couldn't help to, to be you know, inquisitive of where was my medicine coming from initially here in Colorado with those caregivers. And then when I went to a basement and saw all the, the tie-dye nutrients and pictures of girls on the wall, scantily clothed, and all these like beautiful little plants in this filthy room, I was like, this isn't where medicine should come from. So I started to tap into my- Just so you know your uh, presentation is not open yet. Well, that, that's uh, wonderful. That, that's, uh, um, it says so sharing screen here, but... Um, that, yeah, we see it, but it's still like in, not in like presentation mode. That's all right. You know, it's okay. a little uh, non-traditionally. Okay. <laughs> so like I said, um, uh, th thanks so much for the heads up there. But yeah, the, most people like master grower didn't mean master business person. So navigating compliance and licensed applications, I got a lot bigger to help those operators in Colorado 2007 through nine through that, got to pick up some equity positions and really learn what states do when they transition from a quasi-legal to a legal to a full adult use market. So now over this last you know, few years, you know, now well over a decade, um, 3C has now worked in 34 of the states. Um, we've worked in more states with investors and then worked in 17 countries and holding equity positions in, in well over 160 uh, companies. 3C itself is a you know, single member LLC that has holdings, uh, companies above that just to limit liability. But then through that, we're able to actually sometimes take equity positions and clients in really long-term um, positions with our companies and clients. Now, I didn't want to just start a company. This was actually accidental years ago and have now you know, very much scaled into this industry, but it was really to make the industry more environmental, responsible just for actually using agricultural principles to produce an agricultural commodity. You know, through that, we have this patchwork of US states where we have worked in every single state since its inception. So with our knowledge management system, we know what's happening, where it's happening, and when. And through that, able to make 
you know, creative marketing approaches and help businesses, especially now with social equity programs, to really create bona fide lasting companies and deep confidentiality agreements with our clients. But many of the multi-state operators were clients, you know, back in the day, some of which we have positions and we get to watch and, and nurture them grow. So in actually contemplating a raise for the first time in 3C's you know, history, um, as we just always cash flow the business and can continue to. But as we're growing, looking for some more strategic partners in running larger scale uh, consulting companies, because when you think about our revenue model, um, we're a relationship based firm when we do, you know, any sort of when I put my investor hat on like a consulting company is just revenues. But when it comes to the equity positions, the holdings, and what we get to know, um, building a larger relationship with some strategic capital, helping other investors with their investment strategies, vetting investments. And also when we see unique advantages come up, it's not just looking for a, you know, a minority shareholder position here, um, easily can continue to justify cash flowing the business as we grow. But when you think about what we've done over this last well over 10 years with myself at the helm, you know, having worked in all of these markets and had multiple offices, um, we've really gotten to see the industry in a way that most people don't get to get under the hood with companies or when there's a problem with applications or when Illinois is popping up and putting in 91 dispensary applications for clients, many of which taking equity positions or having referrals and different uh, commission agreements coming forth. It's allowed us to see things differently. So, you know, I've got a, a large team, most of us in the United States. I've got some staff in South America, some staff in Europe. Navigating those compliance issues of working in these new countries has been been great, but having eight different languages um, as part of our skill sets as our team, not just from my background as a linguist, but always looking for that diverse uh, kind of group to help. And when I think about what, what the raise is here, it's essentially I'm doing a 2 million convertible note. Um, this would actually be able to come into three CR holdings companies and portfolio companies past, present, and future. And as a typical use of funds, marketing and branding and really entrenching to get through this next 18 to 24 months, even though things are stable and fine and, and actually growing well, but to really entrench ourselves as a large term kind of exit for a consulting company acquisition or just continue to build our equity portfolio. But be it consulting services, the investment management services or starting these new companies in the new states, just finished Dutch applications for coffee house uh, production just this last week. Um, today I already worked in in Massachusetts, in Michigan, in Maine, in Arizona licenses, California delivery company work this, this morning, and then also dealing with some Peruvian uh, financial structuring here this afternoon. So never know what we get to get into, but I'd love to have some strategic capital and direction and uh, outside kind of services to help us grow with this uh, capital raise if we choose to do so. Great. Thank you, Nick. Uh, judges, uh, let's just see if anyone I haven't heard from a little bit, uh, Frank or Daniel? Other one, you'd like to kick it off? Yeah, I, 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 I would. I, I'm curious to know what is, um, you know, you, you had mentioned that you, you have a long term, um, you know, you kind of have long term investments. Um, I know VCs typically have that time frame that they want to kick companies off the, off the books, right? Or, or you know, get the, the exit. How long is the typical uh, hold for you? Uh, f f from our venture fund and what we do, or, or are you mentioning with 3C and our equity positions? Yeah, with 3C and your equity positions. Is there a time frame or is it just, you just let them run? You know, m most of our funds, we do like seven year exit. But when it comes to our portfolio companies, I've, I really have a short, medium and long term approach with some of these positions. Some I know are going to cash flow and have nice exits when, when it comes to data companies or companies with more IT kind of platforms. Others with many of our international positions, we know that those aren't going to have really good cash flows, balance sheets, and EBITDA for the next two to three years, but the long-term positions will be phenomenal. So I like to balance our equity holdings based on that strategy. Some quick cash flows, like I sell a Danish company for 5.4 million euros, have various equity positions within that, some nice exits for you know the internal shareholders that we, that we use that for. But um, it, it's definitely balanced based on the portfolio company. What are the terms on the convertible note and uh, you know, what do you see in terms of uh, happening kind of down the road in terms of path of growth for you guys? So you know, that, that convertible note, I'm open to different options um, depending on what the investor would need for that because there's just capital and I can do that all day. I mean, I was dealing with my London investment group earlier today and I could, I could go to that, but I'm really looking for strategic capital. So on a convertible note basis, um, those terms I'm, I'm flexible on. 3C's done well over 12 million in revenue over the last five years just alone. 
um, equity positions on that, depending on who you're using for your independent valuations, um, could be well over 100 million uh, domestically and about 200 million internationally. Um, so that, that convertible note, I'd be open to structuring that to where essentially if payments aren't meant, that's an equity grant um, you know, with, with board seat strategic directions in the larger holdings company. Um, but, but mostly I, I would be doing that at like a $10 million valuation for that 2 million convertible note with some additional options and warrants if, if, if desired. Nick, in the convertible note, when it does convert, will there um, also go interest in these 150 or 100 um, companies you have equity interest in or the firm does? Yes, ma'am. Um, so, you know, I started my company selling my, uh, my pickup truck about in 2009 to make payroll and become bona fide. But yeah, of those equity positions that I've coalesced over the years, um, I wouldn't be setting some sort of like timeline where all previous ones are mine and you get to be in part of you know, just the future. So this is all past, present, and future equities that would be on the table for us that we acquire. Um, but that would be through a holdings, you know, as you know, Sherry, uh, unless I made a specific um, SPV, like a special purpose vehicle for each at, um, portfolio company or client that we get, get equity in, when it comes to, let's say, the Bureau of Cannabis Control in California, like owning 15% of a company there, I might hold that equity and it goes to a holdings company for how like profit sharing and distributions would happen. But if I were to add you, let's say at a 20% position of that, you then get the joy of doing all the background uh, checks every six months, fingerprints um, in, in multiple markets. Hence why I have a, a live scanner on call when it comes for those sorts of positions. So that would be an all past, present and future. Nick, can you just unshare your screen real quick? Yes, and then yes, we have time for one last quick one. And if I can ask a follow on, like, wh where is that portfolio valued that you have? And then how do you plan on funding successive rounds in that? You know, so, so current, current equity positions here, I'm setting like the value of the, the consulting company lower based on revenue streams, um, even, you know, operating 50% margin, it's still the cash flow of the business. Um, domestically, I, I would state that depending on your valuation, um, independent auditors, I'd say that's around 100 million currently in domestic domestically and internationally about 200 million. Um, many of these positions though, just based on current times, I'm not looking for liquidity events based on current market trends or any sorts of IPOs. Um, for those portfolio companies currently, that'd be a death sentence. So, um, you know, cu currently based on domestic and international, I'd say well, well over 300 COVID times, you could easily cut that in half to 150 if you wanted. Um, for 3C, for su successive rounds, I'm pretty comfortable with where we at. I just know that we, where we could go with some gas. It's like what I do with all of our investments with, with portfolio companies and clients. Um, I just like to ramp this up a little bit faster, make it a little bit more bona fide and professional in a few of these different markets where we have massive work to do. Um, but instead of taking all of these minority equity positions and growing organically, I think we can grow a lot faster. While many companies are starting to fail in the space, we're thriving and have been for years. I just want to get bigger, faster to be able to help this investment network get more equity positions uh, in some very unique and sometimes exclusive portfolio company opportunities. And also, you know, to be a homie, help you with your, your side too. We have a breadth that's bigger than anyone I know when it comes to our network for how long we've been around. And I'd love to be able to help leverage uh, some wisdom uh, and praxis with some other investment opportunities and funds as well. Thank you, Nick. Super. Great. Uh, okay, so up next we have Nicole Wicker, CEO and founder of Atopa. We're doing great here. This is, uh, I think we're all being very mindful of time and sharing, and so thank you for everyone. Okay, hold on just a second, please. Yep. And um, actually, why I'm getting my screen set up. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, start. I'm Nicole Wicker, the CEO of Altoba. And uh, we all know that consistency is a challenge in the cannabis industry. And, and we've all kind of accepted that cannabis is not consistent. Um, even the states have, tests, have accepted this because... Um, I just realized I'm not on video. Um, okay. Okay. Hi. Um, even the states have accepted that uh, to pay it past state requirements, cannabinoids must be plus or minus 10 to 15 percent 
in deviation, which means that it's acceptable to have a 30% deviation in, in your cannabinoids, which is really not acceptable. And let's talk about terpenes. We all know the importance of terpenes, um, but states don't even test for terpenes and labels don't even have the terpene content on, the, on it. So most of the times you do not know what terpenes are in your cannabis product. So imagine if there was a way to control the level of THC in every single product that was created, every single cannabis product, and people could start titrating the amounts of THC. Imagine if you could add terpenes to your cannabis product, such as limonene and pinene in the morning to help you wake up and energize you, and linalool and myrcene at night to help you sleep through the night. And one of you earlier was saying it would be great if, let's say I found something for pain and I flew to California and I could walk up to a dispensary, give him the formulation, and he could create it exactly the same every time. That would be amazing, right? Well, that is what we've created. What we've created is the world's first electronic apothecary. It's the first device that creates personalized pharma grade cannabis products with precision on demand. Similar to an inkjet printer, the O-Blend holds canisters that are filled with cannabinoids such as THC, CBC, CBN, CBG, and essential oils such as isolated terpenes. The O-Blend dispenses each ingredient directly into a variety of containers such as vape cartridges or tincture bottles or culinary oil or even personal lubricant. Every time you see this O on a product, it means that the O blend has created this product, guaranteed to have four things. It's safe, the ingredients are safe, they've been tested by Altopa before they were put into our canisters. It's personalized. This product has been created just for you. It's consistent and it's precise. Well, what does that mean? The O blend is blending cannabinoids and terpenoids within pharmaceutical precision. Um, I mentioned the state standards of 20 to 30 percent deviation. Our cannabinoids are plus or minus less than 1 percent, and our terpenes are less than 3 percent. And we are talking about microliter amounts, which is amazing. The second part of the O blend is the desktop app. This is where users come in and they can find recipes. They can customize them and then they can create personalized pharma grade blends on demand. It's loaded with formulations from experts such as Dr. Ethan Russo. You can search for medical ailment. You can search for the highest rated blends. Uh, you can save your favorite recipes. You can share them with your friends. You can see what other people are using uh, that have similar ailments that you have. Um, so you've got your device, you've got your desktop app. The, uh, the third component is the data. Every time somebody interacts with the O-Blend, we are collecting that data to enhance our user's experience. We can see the clusters of ingredients that are working for different medical conditions. We can sort by patient demographics. We can see the optimal delivery modalities and dosing protocols. The O-Blend is powered by a technology called microfluidics. Microfluidics made a lot of advancements in the biotech industry over the last two decades. No company has yet to bring that in the hands of consumers. Um, so we've been very aggressive building a patent portfolio. We've been granted 22 patents. We've spanned those across 33 countries. Uh, we have been issued our key utility patent. We have several more in the works. We just filed another provisional. We have continuations, we have divisionals. It's a big opportunity that goes beyond cannabis. Thank you, Nicole. Just so you know, you're past, just past five minutes. Oh my, okay, our team is awesome. Uh, beta launch, we've completed. 
Uh, Oblins created over 100 products. Favorite ones were those by Ethan Russo, which is one of our partners. Commercialization, we're raising money for our commercial launch. This is when we partner with a cannabis licensed company. They add the cannabinoids. We don't touch the plant. We are just a platform. And then uh, you've got your users, your cannabis license, your customers. We have signed letters of intent with all sorts of great people like Bear to Farm Mouth, which is a GPO in the medical cannabis industry. Uh, Revolutionary Clinics owned by Ryan Anson, uh, MJ Housing, and uh, a lot more. But let me just get to uh, the app. Yeah. So, It's hard to present all this in five minutes for our company because there's a lot to it. I know what okay. you mean. So, Altopa is seeking a three million Series A financing. Uh, for smaller investors, we have 300,000 remaining in our one million convertible note. You see the terms. Uh, we're post revenue. We have patents. Uh, we have lab validated results. And we're an awesome team. So we're ready to go. We're ready to commercialize and we need funding to do so. Great, thank you, Nicole. Uh, let's jump into the judges. Um, how about John? I haven't heard from you in a little bit. Um, you mentioned uh, that you're working with Ethan Russo or Ethan Russo is a partner. Like you see, providing you with formulations and research. I'm, the uh, reason I'm asking in part is my wife recently interviewed uh, Nathan Russo uh, online and they actually have, have quite an interesting relationship. So I'm just trying to understand um, what, in what context you guys operate. So um, we know Ethan pretty well. Um, we live on the same little island with him, Bashan. And uh, when he was working with ICCI, he gave us proprietary formulations for treating daytime pain, nighttime pain, anxiety, and insomnia, both in just the hemp CBD form and with cannabinoid sourced ingredients. Um, and that's, we have an agreement signed with him that says he can provide us with formulations, but that's as far as we've gotten. I see, so he can provide you with formulations, but uh, is he a shareholder or director in the company? Yeah. Okay. Anyways, would you mind sending me your deck, please? Absolutely. Not at all. Thank you. Good presentation. Thank you. Hey, Nicole. Uh, back to the product for a second. You say you're in production, so I just wanted to get an idea of where you are now in scale. Have you built a few of the machines, and how much product have you moved? Um, also, just wanted to ask you about the testing as well, because I think third-party testing would validate. Maybe just talk to that, uh, too. Thank you. Okay, when I say we're, we were in production, we um, just completed our beta launch. And the purpose was to test the, the Oblins and the platform. And we actually send out FDA validated questionnaires to patients. So we wanted to test that before we're ready to deploy Oblins with a cannabis license holder. Um, we've been creating hemp CBD plus isolated terpene products for these patients. We've sold over a hundred blends and um, our model used to be a D to C, but we have changed it and we realized you don't need an O blend to create these products. You just need the platform and we're recurring revenue. We generate our, our revenue from licensing um, the canisters. They're filled with ingredients. Uh, so we are not building a lot of O blends um, one of my slides that I didn't get to showed how much an O-Blend could produce. So one O-Blend can create 100 blends a day, over 100 blends a day. And if you think about having a few of those in a cannabis license holder, and then you have all these healthcare providers, you know, recommending different formulations for the patients, uh, you don't need to build a lot of O-Blends. So we are in the process of um, building those ones for our commercial launch, but we're not planning on building that many. Bye. Hi, Nicole. It's nice to see you. Nice to see you too, Sherry. How many um, 
what I understand is you have two revenue streams or three, perhaps you actually make the capsules. And uh, if I remember correctly, the capsules collect uh, data. Um, is that not correct? No. Okay. Well, you have a, you have the capsules, you have medical, and you have. No. And well, we're okay. So when you say capsules, we have been creating hemp CBD formulations and. I'm cells. sorry, I meant canisters. I I was using canister and capsule inter interchangeable. So we are selling empty canisters right. to license holders. And if you look at Ryan Anson, which I would love to go back to that slide if I could. No, um, we're at the time, so you just. Okay, so Ryan yeah. Anson has 300 patient, I mean, 300 um, consumers a day that walk in. And if you assume that we create a product for one of them, uh, we have a model to where we get approximately $10 per blend. Ryan has three stores, plus he sells to 17 other stores in Massachusetts. And if you do the numbers, they, they're, they're just crazy if you only charge $10 for a customized, consistent blend. That's our model. And then yes, we're, we're collecting the data. We would like to help other people, including healthcare providers, see what's working for other healthcare providers. So we plan on sharing that data um, with other consumers and make cannabis medicine accessible and safe for people. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, very much, uh, very interesting for sure. Just know there, there are a bunch of questions, uh, Q and A, um, so check those out. And uh, up next, uh, our final speaker is Zach Sakar, the CEO of Polar Extracts. Okay. Thanks, Morgan. Uh, yeah. This is cool today. My uh, favorite part of this industry is definitely the medical side, uh, where we actually get to really help people. So this has been a really cool conference so far. Um, I would like to speak about the technology and infrastructure side of our industry. Uh, and again, I'm Zach Sekar, co-founder of Polar Extracts. Um, as a lot of you might notice, and actually as Cheech brought up, uh, Flower is kind of old school now, right? If you look at data from uh, just the two years since California went adult use legal, less than 50% um, of consumer spending is in the combination of pre-rolls and, and loose flower, which means more than half of spending is actually on mainly vapes and edibles, but in the medical markets, that's also tinctures and topicals. And that's particularly interesting because those things, you can't just kind of get them right out of the green plant that our farmers are growing. You've got to do some concentration and some extraction first. Uh, and that's what we do. Um, for anyone who's not sure exactly where it all kind of breaks down, you grow the plant and then you've got to do some chemical processing before it gets into the manufacturer and distribution. And by extraction, I really just mean taking the desired compounds or molecules out of the overall plant biomass. There's a lot of stuff you can do when you're processing cannabinoids and terpenes and, and stuff you want out of an interesting plant like cannabis. Um, but no matter what you do, you've got to start by getting it out of the plant. So what we're seeing is that since the fastest growing and already more than, <clears throat> excuse me, half of the market is in concentrate derived products, me getting to reliability and consistency of those concentrate supplies at scale is what all of the companies of the future are going to need. So what we're building at Polar Extracts is exactly what we think the industry needs next. Um, in order to continue to scale, the infrastructure needs to scale accordingly. And specialized large scale chemical processing is going to be a critical component of that. I'm, as I said, I'm Zach Sekar, I'm CEO of Polar Extracts. Um, my co-founder and I are both serial entrepreneurs. I have a background in sales management and community building. Um, and he is a, Sean Kelly is my co-founder. He's a PhD rocket scientist. Uh, with a lot of experience in prototyping, mechanical engineering, and specialized experience in cryogenic ethanol extraction, which is our preferred method. Uh, we'd like it because we believe we can get, uh, and we've shown we can get very high quality, uh, very high efficiency, and healthy extracts from plant sources, um, so long as we're using you know, cultivators who are also at high quality. 
And efficiency is important. If you've ever tried to do anything in manufacturing, you know that it is very capital intensive. So the real question uh, for an investor conference like this is how do we grow a company like this without requiring tens of millions of dollars to build giant factories? We think that the bottleneck in, the, in much of the cannabis industry is this processing infrastructure, but for us, the real constraint is access to capital. What we're doing is building mobile extraction labs that we can use to tackle some of the logistics, distribution, and uh, scalability concerns of building processing technology uh, and factories. They're mobile units, which are built in shipping containers or trailers. Um, they can be manufactured in a central location, but they can actually do their processing uh, in a decentralized fashion, uh, locating either directly on site at a farm or in a you know, ideal geographic location. This also cuts down on some of the other costs like real estate. And the technology to the extent that it is safe to put our IP um, somewhat outside of our hands allows us to uh, explore some licensing opportunities. Um, I can very briefly talk about the economics, um, but I, I'd rather get to questions. Um, but essentially what I'm, I'm most happy about is here in the bottom left corner is due to some customer development I've been working on the last five or six weeks, we're prioritizing just those uh, companies, mainly uh, hemp farms in Southern California, who are willing to work with us on contract processing or toll processing agreements. And what that means is that we don't have to outlay any capital for biomass. So our inventory costs go essentially to zero and we can just spend our money on people and machinery. Uh, and so to do that, uh, we're trying to raise right now $800,000 in this seed round um, on a safe. And as I said, it's primarily towards the manufacturing equipment um, and you know, to further develop our IP portfolio. We want to be actively doing the processing rather than just selling machines because we know we're going to only get better at doing it by doing it at scale. And I think that's all I'd like to talk about in my presentation, um, but I'd be very interested in hearing some questions. Perfect timing. Thank you, Zach. Uh, yeah, why don't we, uh, Joyce, being on the farm, you know, for our mobile extraction, how about you want to sure. kick us off? Yeah, definitely. So, so what does the licensing look like? Is it um, you put like a, a type six processing or a, you know, transport license? Um, obviously, we're seeing a lot of farms coming online. Um, so, you know, and, and the processing, a lot of them don't have on site processing. So the thought of like driving that, you know, 50 miles, 100 miles elsewhere, um, it, it, it obviously is really cumbersome. Um, so I think there's a lot of scale to this, particularly in the next sort of one to three years as folks are starting to build other things. As an example, we do not have a processing facility on site, which is going to be a problem. So this is definitely, uh, you know, I think a, a great area, but I'm interested, yeah, how do you, how do you grab a license for this? Yeah, sure. Um, I agree. It's going to be, it's probably, we hope at least, and we're going to advocate that it does become uh, more normal over the next few years. Right now, we're actually... Um, mostly working just with the hemp CBD companies um, because we're also still figuring out exactly how this is going to work on a licensing um, and regulatory standpoint in the THC touching market. Um, but I would definitely be interested in talking to you more and seeing if we can figure that out together. Sounds good. Let's do it. All right. I guess I had a follow-up question about uh, the mobile compliance. So is it simply a licensing play or are you planning on trying to figure out how to remain in compliance as you move into uh, emerging markets or even existing markets? How's that going to work out? Um, with compliance um, in the THC side? Correct. Um, yeah, that, like I said, that's still somewhat in flux um, and we're figuring out we've been getting conflicting answers for most people we're talking to. So I think everything is still changing pretty rapidly. Um, this is, this includes, you know, environmental and, and fire safety and distribution and as well as, you know, cannabis licensing. So it's still pretty up in the air, uh, but we're, we're working on it and we're, we're planning to employ some consultants as well. Hey, Zach, uh, so I may have missed it, but unit economics on the actual pods, however you're calling them, what, what's the cost to build one of them out and, and what's the throughput or, or revenue per month, year, however you define that? Sure. 
Um, we're expecting to average out about $400,000 uh, to build the shipping container size. Um, and throughput will be roughly 500 kilograms of, um, of, bio, of extract produced a month or more. And, and you're charging per kilogram extracted. How, how does the tolling model work for you in terms of price? Yeah, that um, it's usually yeah, it's uh, it's usually just based on a percentage of however much is is produced. We'll negotiate a cut with the uh, the farm if they want to retain a certain amount. We're also largely doing that model in here at the very beginning for capital constraint reasons, um, but we expect to be also in the business of purchasing. Uh, biomass and wholesaling extract to manufacturers as kind of a longer term business model. Thank you. Yeah. Can you talk about, yeah, go ahead, Dan. Can you talk about sales uh, and, you know, where you are in terms of contracts or licensing partners uh, currently, you know, what your uh, plan is for scaling that and just maybe maybe I missed it, but like, is this currently legal in any U.S. jurisdictions, like to do the mobile extraction? Um, are there other companies doing it? We, we're legal in the hemp CBD side, and we're, we're building some machinery right now for some Southern California-based farms. Um, as far as um, THC side, <laughs> I, I've gotten different answers from different lawyers, so I'm not sure I want to say in a public forum that I agree with one or the other. Um, but yeah, we, we are installing some uh, processing on hemp farms in the Bakersfield area, uh, north of Los Angeles right now for two different companies. Great, thank you, Zach. Yeah. Okay, so that is our uh, eight presenters. Um, so what will happen now is for all the audience, you will be getting a chance to vote. Uh, while you're doing that, uh, I just saw that it popped up. But uh, I'm going to ask each of the judges um, which is their pick, and just a quick 20 second, what is their thought on that? So Daniel, we'll start with you. Yeah, I, I'd say my pick was uh, Amura. Uh, I just thought it was a very interesting kind of novel product, um, dosing, and I think the light uh, cannabis experience, um, you know, is kind of what's going to take this stuff mainstream. So it's uh, important to see these products develop. Great. Uh, Dr. David Kunick, what's your vote? So for my vote would uh, be for a C3 consulting, um, mainly due to the, the, the diversity of what they're doing and the fact that they have many tentacles and many different arenas uh, through not only uh, domestically and internationally, which is really attractive to um, my group of investors as well as myself. Cool. Evan, you're next. Yeah, it's a tough, fast, fast decision you're looking for here. Um, a lot of great companies, a lot of great success. And, you know, just in, in terms of how I, I look at the world and really focusing on, on early stage brand and, and uh, you know, accelerated growth, I really like the, the story behind Element Apothic. I think there's a lot there and it's something that can be developed. You know, obviously being super early, it, it's a challenge, but, but that's, uh, that's what's fun about this space. Cool. Okay, and then up next we have Frank. Yeah, so uh, again, a lot of great companies here. Um, initially, uh, you know, to be fair, I, I, I really like the Mura. I, I think that that's actually a great company. However, I also believe in always backing uh, the jockey. And, um, you know, I think that 3C is a really, really solid situation to get behind. So uh, yeah, I, I, I like 3C a lot. Okay. Thank you, Frank. Uh, John. Sorry, having issues with my um, computer today. I like um, Theracan. I look at the technology space 
And I asked myself the question, why does Facebook give away free access? Why do we have free email accounts? Because data is the new currency. And a company like uh, Theracan is well positioned to collect the kind of data that could be worth a lot over and above the services they provide. Having said that, I also like C3. So, and I'm biased towards what Nicole has. So, <laughs> I'll go with Theracan, but um, I mean, look, there's some really good companies here and I wish them all well. Some really good companies here. Thank cool. you. Thanks. Uh, Josh. So although, um... Levandura and uh, who else? Polar and Oblend all scored higher than Omura. I'm going to pick Omura because I think that um, they have the, the fastest ability to gain market share uh, with the quickest exit strategy. Uh, next is uh, Joyce. Awesome. Some really strong companies. Honestly, these are, these are, uh, this is really tough. Um, for me, I'm going to say Neva labs, uh, mainly because there's, you know, there's, there's not as many, uh, labs, um, at the market right now. And, um, it's an area, uh, where, you know, we sort of need to experience growth and innovation. Um, there's a lot of gaps in that industry. So, um, I think that there's areas to fill and, uh, there's a robust current market as well as, you know, and need to kind of work uh, on the research side. We obviously need a lot more lean in on the research side. Um, but I also uh, felt that uh, PayQuick um, and C3 and Polar were, were super strong. I'm a fan of Amura, so I almost kind of have to like uh, <laughs> not vote there because I, uh, I really like the hardware. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to sit that one out on voting for them. But uh, yeah, I'm going to go with, with Neva. Okay, and Sherry? Ah, I'm talking and unmuted. <laughs> that hasn't happened a lot. I really echo everybody else's comments. Um, Altopa is a company I know well and have a bias towards um, Amura. Um, I work with a big competitor, um, 3C. Uh, I have landed on because um, my first and second and third choices all are actually my first, but I'm sort of precluded, I feel, from Omura and Altopa. So it goes to 3C Consulting. Okay. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, Skip. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, gr great companies and, and some hard choices. Full disclosure, I have a relationship with 3C, so I'm not able to vote there. Um, I like Doblin. I thought that, you know, I, I'm in Silicon Valley and, and uh, I think the land of custom, right? The ability to customize specific blends, uh, maybe even continue to alter those and refine those so that everybody can get the perfect blend. Um, I think that's magical. So I would, um, I would go with Doblin. All right. Well, thank you judges for your votes. Um, and now, I am waiting for the results of the audience poll. There we go. Okay, so the winner from the audience is the Levadura Biotechnology. Congratulations to Alex and team for the, uh, for the audience poll. And then from the judges, uh, it, was, it was 3C. So congratulations to Nick uh, from, the, from the judges side of things. I agree as a host, it was very interesting to hear uh, quite a diverse uh, discussion here. And uh, we love this industry, so it's always interesting to see what's going on. And um, Just thank you everybody for today. So that's the scoop uh, for my end of things. And now I'm going to hand it back to Jim to take us on home. So thank you very much.